Welcome back to Logic 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the Allais Paradox. In the last lecture, we looked at the independence axiom. This was a rule for preferences when an individual is facing uncertainty. What we're going to do in this lecture today is test whether your preferences follow independence or not. We're specifically going to be looking at a set of questions that a man named Maurice Allais originally proposed. Maurice Allais was French, just like Marquis de Condorcet. That's why his name is pronounced Allais. And really, that's your first lesson for today, is that if you're ever saying his name in public, you should say it as Allais and indicate that you know how to pronounce it correctly. Regardless of that, he was the first person to look at these questions, and he noticed that a lot of people expressed preferences that violated independence. So let's test whether yours do here. I have two questions for you. First one is a choice between a couple of lotteries. Lottery A, 11% of the time, pays you $1 million. The remaining 89% of the time, it pays you nothing. Lottery B, 10% of the time, pays you $5 million. 90% of the time, it pays you nothing at all. I want you to pretend as though I actually had the money to do this, and I was actually going to pay you whichever lottery you chose. We can either play Lottery A, or we can play Lottery B. It's your pick. If you need more time, pause the video. But once you have an answer, I want you to, in the comment section below the video, write A or B. But don't submit your answer quite yet, because we have one more question for you in a second. All right, if you need more time, pause, otherwise I'm progressing forward. The second question is another choice between two lotteries. Lottery C isn't really a lottery at all. It's one of those degenerate lotteries. It pays you $1 million with certainty. So if you choose Lottery C, I just write you a check and that's the end of it. Lottery D, on the other hand, is a bit more complicated. 10% of the time, it pays you $5 million. 89% of the time, it pays you $1 million. And 1% of the time, it pays you nothing. Once again, I want you to pretend as though this is real life and choose Lottery C or Lottery D. If you need another moment, pause the video. Otherwise, now I would like you to submit your comment. So your comment should have A or B, and then it should have C or D. And now that you've done that, let's take a little bit of a deeper look at these lotteries. So these are all four of those lotteries that we were looking at before. And I want to do some breaking down and disaggregation of these lotteries to really see what's going on here. And this will make it a little bit more clear how these choices can determine whether your preferences violate independence. So let's start off by looking at that second lottery. That second lottery gave you 90% of the time no money at all, but we could equivalently write it as giving you $5 million 10% of the time, $0 1% of the time, and 89% of the time giving you no money. That's just like it was before, it's just that we've broken down the $0 outcome into a couple of different outcomes. And likewise, we can turn this lottery B into a nested lottery. How do we do that? Well, we can think about this as 11% of the time, giving you the lottery where 10 out of every 11 times it pays you $5 million, and 1 out of every 11 times pays you no money at all. And then the remaining 89% of the time pays you no money. Notice that this follows the format of lotteries as we were looking at them in the last lecture when we talked about independence specifically. Now that we've done that, now that we've disaggregated Lottery B, we can compare it to Lottery A very easily. Notice that both Lottery A and Lottery B pay out $0 89% of the time. So whatever is determining your preference for Lottery A versus Lottery B has to be not caused by this fact that there's 89% of the time giving you no money at all. It has to be with whatever is remaining. Well, with whatever is remaining, 11% of the time, that's what's going on in both of those cases. So it needs to be your preference for $1 million versus your preference for the lottery where 10 out of 11 times you receive $5 million and 1 out of every 11 times you receive no money. That preference, whether you prefer what's in red on the first line or what's in red on the second line, that needs to be determining your preference for lottery A versus lottery B. So one interesting thing to do on your own, and no need to post this on the comments below, but if you think about whether your preference is $1 million or that lottery in Lottery B that's now highlighted in red, that needs to match whatever your answer was for your preference between Lottery A and Lottery B. 
If you prefer $1 million to that nested lottery, then you should have answered originally that you preferred lottery A to lottery B. And if you said that you preferred the lottery that's highlighted in red, then you should say that you preferred lottery B to lottery A. Now let's look at lotteries C versus lottery D. What's going on here? Well, we can break down lottery C not as $1 million with certainty, but as paying you 11% of the time $1 million, and 89% of the time, $1 million. We can also do some disaggregation of one of these lotteries. In Lottery D, we can think about this as a nested lottery, as we did before, very similar to what we did before, where 11% of the time you're playing this lottery, this nested lottery, where 10 out of every, 10 out of every 11 times you receive $5 million, and 1 out of every 11 times you receive no money at all. Then the remaining 89% of the time, you're receiving $1 million, just as it was before we did the disaggregation. Well, now we can do some playing around with a comparison between Lottery C and Lottery D. Notice that in both cases, 89% of the time, you're winning a $1 million. So your preference for Lottery C versus Lottery D can't have anything to do with the fact that 89% of the time, you're receiving $1 million. It's also the case that the remaining 11% of the time, we can sort of erase that. And notice that your preference for Lottery C versus Lottery D needs to be determined by your preference for either $1 million with certainty or receiving $5 million 10 out of every 11 times and 1 out of every 11 times receiving no money at all. Maybe a light bulb just went off, but you'll notice that what's highlighted in red for Lottery A versus Lottery B and what's highlighted in red versus Lottery C and Lottery D, it's the same. What's determining your preference for Lottery A versus Lottery B should also be determining your preference for Lottery C versus Lottery D. It all comes down to whether you prefer $1 million to the lottery of $5 million 10 out of every 11 times, and no money at all 1 out of every 11 times. Now this means we can use your answer to see whether your preferences violate independence in this particular example. If you chose lotteries A and C, or you chose lotteries B and D, you're good to go. That had consistency over that lottery between $1 million and the $5 million and $0 lottery. However, if you chose B and C, or A and D, now your preferences violate the independence axiom. You had a preference for $1 million in one case, and a preference for the $5 million versus $0 lottery in the second case. And if you're in the second category, let me just assure you, you're not alone. I've done this before. I've had a very similar lecture where I laid out the Allay paradox, and so I have some data on what those people answered previously. We had, out of 136 respondents, 16 choosing A and C, and 82 choosing B and D. That's all told 98 out of 136, or 72% of people choosing the quote-unquote right answer that does not violate independence. But 16 people chose A and D, and 22 people chose B and C. That's the quote-unquote wrong answer that violates independence. So a full 28% of the time, we had individuals who prefer whose preferences violated independence. So what's going on here? Why might we see some individuals violating independence under these circumstances? Well, one answer is if we look at lotteries C and D, maybe if you chose lottery C, what was going on in your head was that you saw lottery C guaranteed you a million dollars and that looked really attractive. And despite the fact that lottery D pays more on average, right, it's giving you $5 million 10% of the time, that's a lot of money. But because there's some risk involved in choosing Lottery D, 1% of the time you receive no money at all, you might want to steer clear of Lottery D, take the sure thing, and pick Lottery C. But then in your decision for Lottery A versus Lottery B, looking at that, well, Lottery A and Lottery B, they both have some sort of risk. You're going to make no money some percentage of the time, regardless of which one you choose. And so maybe now, because you're faced with some sort of risk guaranteed in either case, you choose Lottery B. But notice, again, from when we disaggregated those lotteries, that's really not what should be going on, at least if your preferences follow independence. If you think independence is a good axiom, if you think that that's something that your preferences should be following, it really, again, 
all comes down to that choice between $1 million with certainty and that lottery between $5 million and $0. So that at least answers the question of why someone might choose B and C. If you're someone who chose the other quote-unquote wrong answer, A and D, I'd be very curious for you to write another comment explaining to me why you chose A and D and, and what was going on, what at least in your head, you justified that answer for. Just to be clear, if you answer one of these questions wrong, that doesn't mean there, there's something wrong with you inherently. That might just be one of the preferences that you have, and you expect the utility theory isn't going to be doing a very good job of representing your preferences. So again, once more, I'd be very curious to know what's going on if you answered A and D, because I don't really understand that as much as I understand why someone might choose B and C. Now, that being said, if your preferences violated independence, I want you to try the following exercise. Assign some value for winning $5 million, assign another value for winning $1 million, and assign a third value for winning $0. This might just be a scale of your happiness for each one of those outcomes, right? This is like assigning utilities over outcomes as we've been doing all along. So it could be if you just value money at face value, $5 million or 5 million points of utility for choosing or for winning $5 million, 1 million points for winning $1 million and zero for winning zero. Or you might just realize that, hey, you know, $5 million isn't worth or doesn't make me five times as happy as if I win a million dollars. And so there might be some sort of discrepancy there. But either way, I want you to assign some sort of utilities for each one of those outcomes and then calculate your average expected happiness or your average expected utility. There's that phrase for each of those lotteries. And now look at whether your preference changes. And then if it does, think back to your original decision just looking at the lotteries and see if that has changed your mind. So once again, if you had an answer that violated independence before and you've gone through this exercise, you're going to have to pause the video and actually spend a lot of time doing this. But if you do that, I'd be very curious to see if this changed your mind. And especially if it didn't change your mind, why it didn't change your mind. Okay, so that's all of the discussion about whether this independence axiom is uh, something that you follow or not. Now let's just talk about whether independence is a good axiom to have in general, because we need independence once again to be able to use expected utility theory. And I think for mundane issues, independence shows that we have a problem. The Allais paradox demonstrates that we have individuals, perhaps you, at least 28% of the people who watched the previous lecture had preferences that violated independence. We know that we have preferences out there that are violating independence. So for mundane issues, I think that independence is definitely a problem. And so we might have some issues when we are trying to run models that use expected utility theory on these sorts of mundane issues, which is something that I've expressed concern about before. So nothing really has changed there that much. But once again, for not so mundane issues, for important issues, it's unclear just how bad the bite is of the Allais paradox. Do people report preferences in the Allais paradox experiment that violate independence because they actually have preferences that violate independence or because they're doing some sort of sick form of rationality? And what I mean by that is as follows. Suppose that you're taking this experiment just like you just did. You have two choices. You could spend some time and really think about the alternatives, or you could finish the experiment as quickly as possible because you're going to make $15 regardless of your answer. Or in the case, if you just did this right now for this video, as you were watching it, you weren't getting paid anything at all. So that might give you even more incentive to get it done as quickly as humanly possible. Well, if you're spending a lot of time and thinking about it, you're more likely to report a preference that is actually what you have. If you're trying to get this done as quickly as possible, you might not be really thinking about the consequences of your decision. And if you're not thinking about the consequences of your decision, you might make something that looks a little bit silly, or you might choose an answer that isn't really reporting what you really would want it to report if you were actually playing these lotteries and making potentially millions of dollars. So when we have people playing these experiments in real life, people are rationally trying to get out of these labs as quickly as possible. But if the experiment were real, I think we would have substantially fewer people reporting preferences that violate independence, not only because individuals would be thinking about their preferences a little bit more seriously, but I also suspect that individuals would be consulting others, right? If you had a real lottery that might pay off $5 million, that would be literally the biggest decision of your life. Right? I don't think very many of us have had bigger decisions in our lives that, than something that is potentially going to pay you $5 million. I certainly haven't. 
So if I were to ever be involved in such a huge monumental decision in my life, I would want to consult other people and think and ask what they think about that. And you would probably want to do that too. And so it might be the case that if on the first pass, when that lightning quick snap judgment that you made about your preference violated independence, it might be the case that if you actually sat through this and you reasoned it out with some other people, that you might do something very similar to what I suggested about calculating, and this is very cold, but such as life when you're dealing with lots and lots of money. It's a very cold decision to be made, but when you start calculating things out, you might then realize that you prefer one lottery to the other in a way that does not violate independence. So in either way, the Allay paradox is really fascinating because it does show that individuals do not, certainly do not uh, consistently follow independence in these very quick judgments. And that's concerning, and that's something we should be highlighting. But how much this damns the enterprise of expected utility theory, I'm not so sure about that. I don't think it really does, uh, could crush us entirely, especially when it comes to these big issues, which for me, what I study is the type of stuff that I want to study, and I think also the types of things that we really should be studying because bigger issues are more important, and so they're more worth our time anyway. All right, that wraps up this very long lecture on the LA paradox. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time when we talk about the continuity axiom. Take care.